Welcome to the Smart Materials and Intelligent System Design course and uh, we are running now module 3 and in this module I have already talked to you about the fundamental equations of piezoelectricity in the last lecture. We have discussed about the piezoelectric coefficients and uh, different piezoelectric materials and their properties, simplified equation of piezo patch and also I have introduced you to the concept of active strain expression and an Euler Bernoulli model of the same system. Now, today we will go little more in depth in the modeling of piezoelectric actuator. So, in this while doing it we will be assuming a simpler model to demonstrate the concept which is based on uniform strain model and how this uniform strain model is actually inducing strain in the system. So, the whole essence of the modeling is that the piezoelectric patches when they are embedded or they are surface bonded over a host material, they actually induce strains when uh, you know they are getting actuated and that strain is generating further structural strain in the composite body or in whatever the host body with which it is attached or embedded with. And that particular concept that it is not that it is giving a force, but it is inducing a strain that is what is the essence of this induced strain actuation model. Because there are some other models that uh, are available in open literature where the piezoelectric material or the similar type of smart materials, their actuation is modeled in terms of external forces or external moments. But here we do not do it, we are considering these materials to be integrated in a structure in such a manner that they are giving internal forces or strain actually not force, they are generating internal strains in the system in the form of induced strain. Also, I will talk a little bit about various piezo actuators and sensors and uh, some displacement and force measurement techniques. So, uh, in the un uniform strain model uh, that we are going to talk about, here we are assuming that the strain remains constant across the piezo actuator, okay, while it varies linearly inside the substructure. And that is a valid assumption provided the thickness of this piezoelectric patch is actually very, very thin. And this model is very popular for surface bonded actuation because they are indeed because this piezoelectric material is not embedded. So, the variation of strain if you consider as uniform strain versus that uh, linear variation in the Bernoulli Euler model uh, that difference is not very significant. So, uh, this is perf uh, you know much more useful for surface bonded actuation. Now, for each of these models we have also considered that there is not a single actuator, but a pair of actuators uh, and they are embedded or bonded on top and bottom of the beam. So, that you know they can not only generate uh, in plane strain, but also out of plane bending. So, this bending generation is feasible through this model. This model was originally developed by Crawley and Anderson. Also another thing that you know I have already told you that the uh, induced strain remains constant across the piezo patch while it varies linearly inside the substructure that is the main theme of this particular model. So, you can see that this is for surface bonded extension you can see that the strain in the piezoelectric layer is constant. This is for surface bonded bending, here also the strain in the piezoelectric layer remains constant, whereas in the rest of the uh, part as usual for bending there is this uh, you know linear variation of the strain, you know it varies from the tensile to the compressive strain. Now, 
if you look at the embedded extension they are also for extension uniform variation okay and if it is embedded bending here also for the piezoelectric part it is uniform and then the linear variation starts so this are all the relevant sketches that are important for us to get the you know model of this induced trend actuation now if you consider any one of this model what you are going to see is that there are two piezoelectric actuators one in the top another in the bottom so each one of them let us say is generating a force fa so two fa they are identical plus fs that is the force in the substrate and that should be equal to the total force in the system that is simple force balance of strength of materials. Now, what is the expression of this F A? Well, it must be having a stress times the area. So, this is the stress part of it. If we assume that the strain in the active layer is S A, then that stress is E P times S A, that times A P gives us the force that is each one of the forces in the piezoelectric material. So, there are two of them uh, in case of uh, you know uh, simple extension okay. in this case the forces are adding up. So, there are two of them. So, that is what is the force from the active part and if you look at the uh, substrate part once again the stress is E S S S times A S. So, that is the force in the substrate. Now, that these are the forces that is generated inside the structure as a response to what as a response to the induced strain. So, the induced strain the free strain is lambda and then you have two of these. So, it is two lambda two of this piezoelectric material generating double the strain then you multiply that with the uh, modulus of elasticity of the piezoelectric material E p you get the stress multiply that with the area you are going to get the force. So, that is the force which is as a result of the induced strain actuation and that force has to be equal to the total force uh, or the resistance that is coming from the structure. Now, in this particular case for the uniform strain model we have assumed S A equals to S S. So, in this particular equation if you look at it E p is already known to us modulus of elasticity area of the piezoelectric material known to us modulus of elasticity of the substrate known to us A s is known to us lambda is known to us that is characteristics of piezoelectric material modulus of elasticity is known to us area of the piezoelectric material is known to us. So, what is unknown to us this is one single equation where we had two unknowns S a and S s. But since S A equals to S S, so we should be able to get you know if I just represent it as S, we should be able to get S from this one single expression itself. And if you do a little bit of algebra now, you will see that that S will come out in this beautiful form that is 2 lambda over 2 plus psi E, where psi E can be written as the in plane stiffness ratio that is E S A S over E P A P. So, essentially if I know what is the free strain that my piezoelectric crystal is generating, I can actually set this in plane stiffness ratio because uh, area of the piezoelectric material is fixed, but area of uh, you know this part E S A S the host part is actually you know according to our necessity we design the system. But if we can do that and we can get a stiffness ratio and that stiffness ratio will finally, dictate that what will be the strain that we will be getting in the system. Not only that you can also vary lambda if you consider lambda if you look at it that lambda is nothing but it is a function of actually electric field intensity. So, it is a function of voltage over the thickness of the piezoelectric material and this voltage can be actually varied. So, this voltage is variable. Okay. So, I can vary V, I can vary V increase or decrease V and as I change this V, I can change this lambda, as I change this lambda, I can change the strain and as a result I can change the deflection of uh, you know such kind of a system. Now, similarly 
uh, you can also balance in this earlier case we have balanced the force, you can also balance the bending moment versus the bending resistance. So, in this case instead of uh, you know we will be having this uh, area moment of inertia which will come into picture and this is just uh, that simple rule of bending that we use if you remember that from strength of materials that m by i equals to sigma over y, where y denotes the distance from the neutral axis in terms of bending. Okay. So, if I consider any point which is at a distance y and the stress is there sigma, then the moment to area moment of inertia that is the this ratio will be equal to sigma over y and that can be used. So, that means, sigma is your m y over i. So, that has been used in this case in terms of developing the moment equilibrium. So, once we have this moment equilibrium corresponding to bending, we are going to get a very similar expression in the last case the factor was 2 lambda, now it is 6 lambda and 6 plus psi b. So, in earlier case it was stiffness ratio, now it is the bending stiffness ratio psi b which equals to 12 E i s over T s square times E a p. So, here also if you look at it carefully that if you know E p and A p these are all fixed. Okay. So, what is there in our hand one is that the T s square we can design in such a manner that if T s square is more then psi b will be low. So, if T s square increases very fast psi b will decrease at a very fast way and if psi b decreases then this, this entire summation will be less. So, the denominator will be becoming smaller and as a result you will be getting more and more deformation in the system. So, thus you can actually control uh, it through the passive part of the design. In the active part once again lambda as a function of the voltage and you vary this voltage as you vary the voltage you are varying the lambda and you are varying the act active strain that you are generating in the system. So, in a sense you are varying the uh, nature of extent of bending in the system. So, there are two ways in which you can control the bending either by controlling the voltage in an active manner or the passive part is in the basic design itself you control your T s square in such a manner or your I s in such a manner that you get a low psi v and that low psi v will give you high s a that means high strain. So, these are the things that you know we are using in terms of the uniform strain model. Now, in this model there is one basic assumption that is that interfacial thickness. So, there is a piezoelectric material that we have a piezoelectric patch and there is this uh, you know host layer okay. and the other side also there is a piezoelectric material. How do we fix them? By using some kind of a glue we fix them. Now, this glue if it is very very thin then this model that we have discussed is fine, but if this glue is of finite thickness then the you know if this part the whatever is the strain you know we have assumed the strain to be same that is not going to happen. Okay. So, there will be uh, a kind of a gap in terms of the strain transfer and that uh, you know so that is to be considered in terms of a factor which is called shear lag. So, this is the expression uh, you know that has been derived in Crawley's paper. So, here we have this part as usual. Okay but the additional part that is coming up is considering this shear lag that will come into the system which has a gamma term in it and this is how the gamma term is defined. So, if you look at it that if the bonding layer thickness is very very small then you know the T b here denotes the bonding layer thickness then gamma will actually increase enormously and as gamma increases this ratio of cos hyperbolic function that will actually reduce and then it will become simply unity and as a result our initial model will be valid in this case also. 
this uh, you know is the point that we have to keep in our mind that gamma is the non dimensional length parameter which is varying from minus 1 to plus 1 and alpha is 2 for extension and 6 for bending that I have already told you that you know you can see it that uh, here alpha is 6 for bending and uh, the same mod, uh, model you can use uh, alpha as a parameter where alpha is 2 for uh, the extension. And uh, G is the shear modulus of the bonding layer, gamma is the shear lag contributed to, uh, by the bonding layer uh, of thickness T b. And I already told you that a high value of gamma signifies a thin layer with steep bonding and as gamma tends to infinity, we will get back the perfect bonding equations which we have earlier derived. Now, if you actually try to visualize that, that how the shear parameter gamma increases, you would see that the fraction of the perfect bond displacement that gradually approaches unity, meaning thereby that our assumption of S A equals to S A s is valid in this range where gamma is very, very high and that actually indicates that the thickness of the bonding layer T B is very, very small. T B is very small, then only this particular thing will approach unity and as a result the effect of shear lag can be neglected. Now, this uniform strain model can also be used in terms of getting the force. Okay. So, we can uh, you know just extending the same thing we can find out the shear force that is there in the system and uh, you know you can get it just simple extension or uh, by using the equations that I have already discussed. So, let us try to discuss this uh, whole concept with the help of an example. The example that we have chosen is that of a bimorph. Okay. So, you can see a bimorph here and in that in this bimorph what you have is a uh, you know piezoelectric material, two piezoelectric layers which are joined together, okay, two actuators placed at the top and bottom of the specimen and we can apply opposite voltage to each one of them. So, that we can actually generate a bending out of the situation and this is a typical MEMS system we have discussed about that uh, kind of flow control where this kind of MEM system can be used and the length of the beam is 2 millimeter width is 200 micron meter thickness is about 100 micron. So, it is a very very small MEMS type of applications. Now, we are using two 50 micron meter thick piezoelectric actuators in this system. Okay. So, they are glued together. So, total you are getting 100 micron meter. Uh, let us say the modulus of elasticity is known to me 65 GPA coupling coefficient D 3 1 which is important in this case, because we are applying voltage from the 3 direction and we are getting you know in plane actuation. So, that is known to me that is relevant here and also uh, the elastic modulus uh, you know the host beam is made of uh, silicon. So, that uh, is elastic modulus is known to me top actuator has about 100 volts and the uh, uh, bottom is minus 100 volts. So, the first thing, so what we have to find out is the deflection at the free end of the bimorph beam. So, in order to do that, the first thing that I have to know is that what is the area moment of inertia of the host beam, because I know the host beam size, I can very easily find it out as 1 12th bh cube and then I can find out what is the flexural rigidity E i s. The moment I find it out, I can actually find out what is psi b, okay. that is this ratio I can find it out, which will come out to be about 1.54. Now, for bending we know that alpha is equals to 6 and free strain lambda is uh, also known to us, uh, we can find it out because the voltage is known to us, which will give us lambda to be 100 micron strain. So, we can use this data and we can find out what is the force that is acting on the top of the host beam, which will come out to be 0 0.026 Newton. Exactly an opposite force is there in the bottom. So, this actually comes up in the form of a couple. So, if we know the thickness of the beam, we can find out that what is the moment that is working on the system. Now, that 
the moment is known to me okay, a simple and the length of the beam is known to me m l square by 2 e i is going to give us what is the you know deflection at the tip of the beam. So, that is you know that is what then we can find out that if this is going to be the tip deflection then we can design the system accordingly in terms of some control. This is uh, you know so can be used for various piezoelectric systems and a maximum strain lambda that you will be uh, you can use is for two is about 2000 micron strain. In some cases one can go for PZN or PMN crystals where you can get up to 8000 micron strain, but that is not very uh, you know a kind of commercially available and even if it will be of very high cost. So, generally the lambda max is about 2000 micron strain and based on that we have to make the design of such MEM systems. Well, can we not because 2000 micron strain is very low. I told you last time you know I have shown you through the graphs in magnetostatic material how low is this kind of microns this 2000 into 10 to the power minus 6. So, you can imagine how small it is. Can we not increase this? Well, there are two ways of increasing it. One is called internally leverage system that means, you do something on this system you know while making this piezoelectric actuators itself. Simplest example is that you stack a uh, lot of these piezoelectric you know wafers, very very thin wafers you stack these wafers. Okay. So, uh, if you have many of, of these things and if you are using D 3 3 parameter that means, you are applying voltage across and you are uh, measuring the reflection along across the you know that is the transverse direction because D 3 3 is much much higher than D 3 1. So, we uh, intend to get a large you know strain along this direction. So, this is one you know internally leveraged system. There are other internally leveraged configurations like rainbow, C block or crescent forms configurations all in these kinds of configurations like rainbow you have a reduced and internally biased oxide wafer. So, in this uh, case what you do is that you have uh, PZT wafers, you just uh, um, lap the PZT wafers and heat them at a high temperature. So, one side of the wafer will get chemically reduced in this heating process. So, this reduced layer which will be one third of the original wafer thickness that will cause the wafer to have internal strains that will shape the one flat wafer into a dome. So, if suppose you know this is what is my piezoelectric patch and I am applying you know thermal load to it. So, I am applying temp temperature and then what will happen is that it will get reduced and it will get a bent shape. Okay. So, if you have this kind of arch bent shapes and if you have two of these then they actually can be very good in terms of you know whatever is the uh, you know this internal strains will help in terms of amplification of the strain output in the system. In fact, this uh, standard rainbows that are available in the market they can show deflection of the range of 3 millimeter compare that with your you know 2000 um, parts per million and the amount of deflection it can generate that is very less, but in the rainbows configuration that same thing can be actually amplified. And the load also is about 10 kg point loads. So, this is one way of increasing the uh, deflection from the system. The other way is to go for externally leverage systems. Okay. So, say for example, the simple you know unimorph systems or in which one part is piezoelectric another part is metal that is uniform or both are piezoelectric and you apply opposite voltage that is the bimorph system or uh, you can have this kind of a system which is flexor based. Okay. This type of systems are externally you know developed mechanical arrangement through which you can actually you know magnify the very small uh, you know strain or deflection 
that will be there in the system. So, the, in this case for example, if you take this one into consideration, you can have many you know stacks layers here. Okay. So, that you can generate whatever is the maximum strain possible in this system along the axial direction. Now, in the because of this particular configuration the flexure you can easily imagine that it is always stiffer along this uh, semi major. Okay. So, whatever is the little deflection here suppose that deformed system if you look at it, it will be much more amplified. Okay. I am just roughly telling you that it will be much more amplified along this semi minor direction. Okay. So, that is what is the advantage you get by having an amplified piezo actuator. The amplification can be as high as 20 times. So, which means these uh, strokes can reach something like a millimeter or so. So, that is the good part of amplified piezo actuators. The uh, other type of uh, this you know increase in this is actually frequency leverage systems. So, in this case what we do is that we uh, develop a system which works like a based on you know AC supply, but it works uh, like a oscillatory system. The series of operations it actually develops the or grows the deflection. So instead of deflection in one shot, you are deflection you are achieving deflections in many many cycles. Uh, but because it is very fast, you can operate it very fast. So, this is the concept of inch arm motors or ultrasonic motors etcetera and uh, for if you look at the inch arm motor concept, you would see that this is mostly used in micro positioning applications. So, the essential concept I have also earlier once explained you that there are two clamps and one extensional element in between. So, the upper clamp and the uh, lower clamp uh, okay, so, we you know when you are keeping the upper clamp on the lower clamp is off and then you are uh, you know extending it and then the upper clamp is off that means it is loosened and uh, then you know you are actually relaxing the position of B and again the upper clamp is on and clamp B is off. So, that uh, the drive piezo is extended and so on and this is done many many times, so that the rod moves up. So, uh, and if you reverse the clamping sequence, you can actually make the rod moving down. Okay. So, uh, this particular type of a system that clamp A, clamp B and extension. So, you can think of it, I have shown it to you earlier in terms of pipe crawling that suppose you have uh, this type of a system, which has two pair uh, of clamps. So, this is your upper clamp, this is your lower clamp and this is the system which actually extends. So, the trick is that you uh, you know initially you put this upper clamp off okay, and while you keep this uh, lower clamping on. So, you are fixing this part and you are releasing it and you are extending it. So, the whole thing moves forward and then you are going to you know clamp this part the A part and then you are taking the B up. So, like that sequentially you do it. So, this is the inch arm concept by which you can do it. In fact, a very interesting expansion of the inch arm concept is in terms of a cricket leg design. So, you, you know in this design what you can do is that you can use this kind of a motor to actually twist uh, you know generate the torsional torsions in the springs. Okay. So, you twist it. Uh, and the motor is tightening the uh, string for example, okay, and you keep a pin okay, so that it cannot retract. Now, once the twisting reaches a particular level, then suddenly you take that uh, you know pin, you drop that pin so that this whole thing can snap back. So, that is how the leg moves down rapidly and then you can get a high you know thrust uh, all of a sudden and you can use it in terms of generating motions in the system. So, these are some of the things that uh, tricks you know that you can use. So, basically once again if you remember that once you develop piezoelectric actuation through the model that we have discussed that you can amplify using three ways internally leverage systems like I told you rainbow systems etcetera 
or externally leveraged systems like I told you Unimorph, Bimorphs and uh, amplified piezo actuators etcetera or by a frequency leverage system and a combination of frequency leverage systems and mechanisms like these cricket leg designs etcetera. So, these are the techniques that we use in terms of generating motion in the system. This is where we will uh, stop today. In the next lecture, we will talk about the magnetostrictive actuator, the blocking force, how to integrate the temperature effect. Also, we will talk about two interesting applications of such systems, one is act active fiber composite and macro fiber composite. Thank you.